In this video, I will demonstrate how to perform hierarchical multiple regression. In this technique, the overall goal is to use um, several independent or predictor variables to predict a single outcome. But in this case, in hierarchical regression, also known as sequential regression, the independent or predicted variables, predictor variables, are entered into the equation in the order specified by the researcher based upon certain theoretical or preferential grounds. So variables or sets of variables are entered in steps, or what's known as blocks, with each independent variable being assessed in terms of what it adds to the prediction of the outcome or the dependent variable. After the previous variables, the variables entered in first, are controlled for. So this is a way to control for the effects of variables that you think might be confounding or covariate types of variables uh, so that we can account for that and again develop a better prediction model for the outcome. So for example if you wanted to know how well a grade point average in undergraduate or standardized test scores would predict someone um, having a certain score on a licensure or certification exam, or if you wanted to determine um, how well flexibility and muscle strength predicted vertical jump or running speed. Um, but we also wanted to control for the effect of age or weight um, or some other potential confounding variable. We could enter our confounding variables into the first block and then our actual predictor variables we want to use to predict the outcome in the second block. And then once all the sets of variables are entered, the overall model is assessed in terms of its ability to predict the outcome or the dependent measure. And so the relative contribution of each block of variables is also assessed and we can determine very precisely how much influence particular, particular variables may be having. Now the assumptions for hierarchical multiple regression are the same as they are for standard multiple regression. We still have sample size issues we need to monitor. We have multicollinearity we need to, to track and monitor. We have to look for outliers and then we also have to look for normality and linearity um, of the outcome variables with the predictor variables. So I'm not going to go into a lot of depth with examining the assumptions in this example. You can see a description of that in standard multiple regression video um, and the procedures are exactly the same as far as evaluating assumptions whether we're doing standard multiple regression or hierarchical medical multiple regression so I'm going to focus more on the interpretation of the model that we produce when we do hierarchical uh, multiple regression. So the example we're going to do uh, for hierarchical multiple regression um, is we're going to uh, use some data in which we're trying to predict someone's perceived stress level as measured by this stress index with a higher score being a higher level of perceived stress. And we're going to use um, a predictor variable that measures someone's perceived mastery of external events also someone's perceived ability to monitor and control internal moods such as uh, physiological uh, responses, mood responses, and that sort of thing. And then we're also going to control for age and we're going to control for an index of uh, social interaction, how well they feel they interact socially. So we're going to use uh, their perception of their internal controls and their perception of their external controls to predict stress while controlling for a measure of social interaction and also controlling for age. So a research question we could come up with from this uh, is if we wanted to control for the possible effect of age and social interaction is our, do our predictor variables, are they still able to predict a significant amount of variance in perceived stress? So to address this question, we are going to do hierarchical multiple regression. So we'll be entering our variables into, in steps or blocks in a predetermined order. 
So we're not letting SPSS decide what order to enter them in, we're, we're deciding. So in our first block, we will force age and social interaction into uh, the model. Okay, so this has an effect of statistically controlling for these variables. And then the second step, or the second block, we will force in our two predictor or independent variables into the model, just as we did um, in the previous example of standard multiple regression. So the difference this time is that the possible effect of age and social interaction has been removed or controlled for, and then we can see whether our block of predictor variables are still able to explain some of the remaining variance in our dependent variable. So that's going to be our, our overall process. So to actually do this in SPSS, we need to go to the Analyze menu, go to Regression, and choose Linear. So we're going to take our outcome variable, or our dependent variable, which is perceived stress, and move that into the dependent variable box. Okay, we're going to move our control, the, the variables we wish to control, into the independent box. So we have social interaction and age. So this will be the first block of variables that we're entering in the analysis. So block of one, or block number one. All right, then we click on the button that says next, and then we enter in the variables that will be our predictor variables or in the second block. So that's our mastery variable and our PCOISS variable. Okay, so we're entering in the variables in two blocks. The first block are the variables that we want to control, and the second block are the variables that we want to use as our predictor or independent variables. Okay, now in the method box, make sure we have enter checked, okay, which is the default. Again, this is, we're forcing them in in a specific order. Okay, then we then click on the statistics button here. Okay, and we want to make sure we have checked estimates, model fit, R squared change, descriptives, part and partial correlations, and then collinearity diagnostics. Okay, and then we go ahead and click continue. Now under the options button, in the missing values section, click on exclude cases pairwise. So again, if we've got a subject that's missing data on one or more of the variables, that subject will be excluded from the analysis. So we click on OK, or I'm sorry, continue. And now we click on the plots button. Okay, and we're first going to click on the variable that's titled star S, or I'm sorry, Z-R-E S-I-D which is this one here. We move it into the Y box. And then we find the variable titled star S-P-R-E-D and move that into the X box. Okay. Where it says standardized residual plots, we're going to tick the normal probability plot box, make sure that's checked. Then click continue. Now we're going to click the save button and we're going to click on oh, we'll look under distances and click on the first option Mahalana I can never say this Mahalanobis and then cooks okay then we click continue and then we click okay so as our output generates again our first step in this process is always going to be evaluating the assumptions that we talked about uh, for this analysis. So I, I'm kind of skipping that step. We're going to assume we've done that. And again, you can get an in-depth description of how to do that in the video for standard multiple regression. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and go into the assumption that we've met all of the assumptions to do this hierarchical multiple regression. So our first step then is to evaluate the model to see if the model actually uh, is able to predict 
uh, the outcome we want to predict. So we go to the model summary table first. All right, and we check the R squared values. So as we see the variables in block one, these are the variables that we want to control for. They account for about 5.7% of the variance in the outcome. So we take that 0.057 number, multiply it by 100, and this is saying to us that the variables that we entered into model number one account for about 5.7% of any variability in our outcome. Now, after we enter the block two variables, okay, these are our actual predictor variables now, we can see that the model as a whole now explains about 47% of the variability in perceived stress. So it's important to note that this second R square value includes all the variables from both blocks, not just those in the, in the second block. So now we've incorporated all four variables, and so we're controlling for variables in the first two block, or in the first block, and now we're seeing what effect all the variables have together after that control. So to find out how much of this overall variance is explained by our predictor variables, the variables we're interested in, mastery and uh, POICSS, after the effects of age and social interaction have been removed, we can look in the column labeled R square change, which is this variable right here. Okay, so in the output presented, you'll see that on the line marked model two, the bottom here, that the R square change value is 0.417. So this means that our, our predictor variables, our independent variables we we're interested in, explain an additional 42% of the variance in our outcome, even when the effects of age and social interaction have been statistically controlled for. So it adds a significant amount of variance prediction. So this is, and if we look over at the SIGF change, we can see that this is statistically significant contribution. So this SIGF change score is less than 0.05, Okay, and so this indicates to us that the addition of these two predictor variables now has a statistically significant contribution to predicting the outcome. Now, if we look at the ANOVA table, just below it, and we look at model number two, we can look at the SIG value, and this again tells us how the model as a whole is able to predict, including all four variables, we can see that this model is a statistically significant predictor of our outcome. Again, less than the 0.05 and less than the 0.01 level. So this model is a statistically significant predictor of perceived stress. So what we've done, again, is we've controlled for two confounding variables, and then we've added in our two predictor variables, and now this model while controlling for the confounding and using the predictor variables is a statistically significant predictor of the outcome of interest, in this case, perceived stress. Okay, so our second step then is evaluating each of the independent variables. So to find out how well each of the variables contributes in the final model, we need to look in the coefficients table. Okay, so we find the coefficients table, click on that. And we're going to focus here on the model two row. Okay, so this summarizes the results with all the variables entered into the equation. So as we look at the SIG column over here, there are only two variables that make a unique statistically significant contribution. In other words, the SIG values are less than 0.05. And you can see that those are our two predictor variables. Our two independent variables make a statistically significant contribution to the model. The social interaction and the age variables do not make a statistically significant contribution. So if we look at our standardized coefficients column, beta, and we look at each of the variables, we can see 
which of our two predictor variables has the makes the most contribution okay the, the largest unique contribution and that is the mastery score and the PCOISS score is a little bit less but these two variables both make a statistically significant unique contribution to the model now neither age nor nor social interaction make a unique contribution now remember these beta values represent the unique these beta values here represent the unique contribution of each variable when the overlapping effects of all the other variables have been statistically removed. So in different equations with different sets of independent variables or maybe if we added some additional predictor variables or additional confounding variables that we control for in model one, these, these values would change. If we had a different sample size, these values would change potentially. So we have to bear in mind that, that this identification of the contribution of these variables is specific to this, this situation, this sample, and this collection of, of variables. Now, as far as presenting results or, or making conclusions, there's a couple different ways we can do this. But at minimum, what we want to what we want to do is is report or indicate what type of analysis was performed. We did a hierarchical uh, re multiple regression. We want to report the standardized beta values. Uh, we can also report the beta coefficients, the B coefficients, if we want to use a actual multiple regression equation, along with their standard errors. Uh, we can report the ANOVA results. Uh, we can report the R squared values. And we want to do that at each step. So we want to report those descriptives at, with, at the first step, model one, as well as at model two. So to summarize, we can use hierarchical multiple regression when we want to, again, make a prediction of a single quantitative or, or continuous outcome using multiple predictor or independent variables while controlling for potential confounding variables by doing a a block pattern of entering the variables into the model. So the first block will always be the variables that we want to control for, and then the second block would be the variables that we want to use as the actual independent var variables, our actual predictor variables. So just like with standard multiple regression, we still have to check for assumptions, so that's always a first step in this process. But hopefully you were able to learn something from this presentation, and hopefully you have good luck using this technique in your future research.